even exercise can't undo the damage of that poor sleep. So um, it, I think it's hard to say, you know, what's the what's the first, second, third order uh, term here in, in in a specific case, but but in in general, I would say that very good sleep, very good nutrition, very good exercise are going to do more for people in most regards than say the mainstream approach, which would be pharmacotherapy. This is Peter Atia, and you're on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Everyone, welcome to another episode of the show. Dr. Peter Atia, welcome. Thanks for having me, Brian. You bet. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? <laughs> Depends which job, I have too many. Well, we're talking about the new book. I'm th I'm thrilled to be reading it. I'm not all the way done, of course. It's uh, I'm taking my time, but um, it's a timely book for me. But let's roll it back in the chronology a little bit. And um, for people who don't know you, let's bring them up to speed. Talk to about talk about your background. Talk about what you're doing. Um, talk about the lead up to this book and and lay it down. Break it down for us. Uh, well, let's see. I, this is a book that um, I started working on about seven years ago, and uh, it's a book that I rewrote a couple of times in the in the way to 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 finally publishing it. And um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about it other than it. I guess it's it's a book I started writing, frankly, before I had a podcast. <clears throat> and once I started podcasting, there was a part of me that thought boy, is there any value in writing this book? Because I can communicate these same ideas through a podcast. Um, and, it, and it's certainly much easier to do so through a podcast. But as the as the book kind of came together, I felt, uh, I felt really grateful that I was working on it. And I think that a book forces you to do something that's very difficult to do in any other medium, including blogging, which I've been doing for a long period of time, which is it, uh, it, it really forces you to sharpen your thinking for everything in one place. And I guess if the listener hasn't figured it out yet, we should probably clarify what the book's about. The book is is about longevity, which is sort of a half-baked term that I think doesn't mean much. Um, but but hopefully I wanted to provide a serious book on the topic that wasn't full of kind of empty half-promises and sort of snake oil. Well, it means a lot to me. It's a, it's a very personal book to me because longevity... Uh... For people who have been listening to this podcast on my side know about my personal journey, how I've not had very good luck with uh, modern medicine, at least, you know, and doctors, uh, although I'm really grateful to doctors who can treat acute injuries. And, you know, if I get my arm bit off by a shark, uh, that can be treated. If I have a major heart attack, that's good. But everything else uh, that I've been struggling with for the last decade as I'm now, you know, uh, this over 40 <laughs> demographic uh, has been very frustrating. So I'm very interested in your book for personal reasons. Uh, it's a super relevant and top of, it has been top of mind for me. I, I'm curious, I have an idea, but I'd like to hear from you. Why did you rewrite it? Uh, and how many times have you rewritten it since, you know, in that seven year period? <clears throat> Uh, the book you're reading and the book everyone would read is the third complete, you know, completely distinct version of the book. Um, and even that version is, as all books, I think, go through this, it's about two thirds the length of the submitted manuscript. So it's not a short book. It's about a 500 page book. Yeah. Um, and it was a third longer than that um, before, um, you know, before we we sort of really chiseled it down into what it what it is today. Um, but again, there were, there were two versions prior and, um, you know, I think the first version was, was really very technical, very, um, very much without a story or a narrative arc at all. And I think very, very rightly so was, uh, rejected by <laughs> anyone who read it as a textbook. Um, I actually really liked it, but I, I, I'm, I'm, but I'm, I'm really grateful to all the people that didn't, uh, didn't mince their words and feedback and saying it was absolutely horrible. Um, 
The second version um, was better, but um, you know, honestly, it just um, it didn't tie together. Uh, there, there, and, and truthfully, there were elements of the second version that made it into the third version. There were no elements of the first version that did. Yeah. I, I was just thinking maybe my mind was wandering a little bit about this idea of how quickly um, science changes or technology changes. So seven years is, is quite a long time. And a lot has happened in the last five to seven years that I can think about. And so I wondered if, if some of those things were updated or refined or, and if so, what were they? Yeah, it's interesting. No. Um, you know, there were, there are a lot of things in science that have changed, um, but it's also amazing how many things haven't changed. And I'm not sure what amounted to greater edits because you could really put them into three categories. There are things where um, you know, the science has changed itself. Uh, there are areas where um, the data are largely the same, but my interpretation of them has changed. And then there are areas where neither of those are correct. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say the most interesting of the three has been the middle bucket. It's been the the areas where when I started writing the book, I sort of felt one way about the information, about the data. And my own evolution has 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 changed and, ha and has refined. Um, and I think that's actually pretty good news because I, I think, you know, if if every year you had to rewrite a book like this because of the pace of scientific development, um, I, I, it would be hard to keep up. But I, I think the good news is that's not actually happening. And I think the that there's a lot of noise out there, but but the true substance of it, which, you know, again, it comes down to things like exercise and, and understanding how to do it and what the benefits are and what the magnitude of it is. Um, that's that's not stuff that's getting turned over. Yeah, that is good news. Uh, and good, I hope that this interview will cut through the clutter. Maybe let's start by, if you could help me define the difference between emotional health and mental health. Well, I think they could be one in the same. I, I, I mean, I, I, I sort of use them a little bit differently, but I, I think maybe some might say the real distinction is between mental illness and mental health. Um, but, but again, if, if we just put the the sort of um, um, the semantics exactly aside, what I'm really trying to distinguish is emotional health or mental health is something that concerns everyone, including you know, people who might not have a diagnosis of a mental illness. So there's a there's a medicalized part of this that is codified in the diagnostic statistical manual uh, of psychiatric illnesses. Um, and someone listening to this might say, well, but you know, I don't, you know, there's nothing that about me that lines up in that manual. So why should I care about this? And what I would argue is no, you you want to care about your emotional health or maybe mental health, depending on the word. Um, as much as you care about your physical health. Um, and it matters just as much to the quality of your life. Yeah, this became clear. And it seems so intuitive, intuitive, but it wasn't to me for so long. And this is one thing that really, about a decade ago, the light bulb really clicked. And that is, there's this interdependence, or there's, there's this correlation between physical health and emotional health you know uh what the, what was that what was the light bulb moment for you uh that they go together that um when i'm taking care of my my body my physical health uh, i'm exercising i'm doing strength training uh weights whatnot um i have I seem to have a better positive mental outlook. I feel better. Um, I am more resilient to take on the stress of the day or the the difficult, you know, when you unexpectedly get punched in the mouth, metaphorically uh, or physically, you're ready for it. You're more resilient. You're more ready rather than before I was maybe not taking care of myself as much. And then the stress would come. 
or I'd, something really bad would happen and I, I wouldn't deal with it as, as well. And um, so I just recognized this relationship. And I also talked to a couple of pro athletes. I think it was Russell Wilson, who I, when I sat down with Russ, he said, you know, I have a physical trainer, you know, he helps me lift and shows me form. Why wouldn't you also have a mental fitness trainer? It makes sense to have someone helping you with, with mental fitness or emotional fitness. And I was like, yeah, you're right. That's, that's totally right. Not, it's not just therapy. <laughs> you know, like if you're, if you're if, sort of your, uh, your mental health side of things, but really the emotional health, uh, I just found goes hand in hand with the physical side. Um, uh, so then break down what metabolic health is. Metabolic health really speaks to, um, I think at its simplest level, um, what our body does with fuel. So we, um, we eat food, of course, for energy. And food is energy in in the form of chemical energy it's chemical bonds so everything you eat is uh organic and it therefore it's made up of a bunch of carbon hydrogen nitrogen oxygen sulfur phosphorus you know all of these things and it's the bonds between those things that contain energy now our body has to figure out a way to take those bonds apart and get the electrical energy that's contained within those chemical bonds and make something called ATP out of it, which I'm sure people have heard of. So the whole process of metabolism is how do you take that chemical energy, turn it into electrical energy, and then back into chemical energy to be used again? That's that's what we are really, really good at. All living organisms do this thing. Um, your metabolic health speaks to how well you do that. And it seems that the less well you do that thing, the more sick you get, full stop. And that means the more you're going to get heart disease, the more you're going to get cancer, the more you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, the more you're going to get other forms of dementia. You're obviously going to get type 2 diabetes, which is a very extreme version of what happens when you, when you aren't metabolically healthy. So in its simplest sense, it is when the body stops being efficient at storing energy and at recouping that energy that it stores. Okay. And so we talk a lot about metabolism and, and maybe you can debunk some of these myths. So mm -hmm. as I'm getting older, I feel like, and I'm sort of just floating with the narrative here, my metabolism is slowing down. Is that a true or false statement? Uh, you know, it's an interesting statement. I don't think your metabolic rate is slowing down as much as you or I think it is. And by the way, I feel the same way. Um, uh, but I do think we partition fuel less efficiently as we age. So as we age, we experience significant changes in hormones. So for example, as testosterone levels go down, uh, as estrogen levels go down, we are more likely to store excess energy in the form of fat. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why giving testosterone to men, giving estrogen to women will improve body composition, even uh, independent of, of energy intake. Um, there are also enzymatic changes, not to get too bogged down in the sort of biochemistry of it, but, you know, there, there's, for example, an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase that determines what your body does with the storage form of fat called triglycerides. And the more lipoprotein lipase you have on muscle cells, the more likely you are to use the storage form of fat to be liberated for energy use. Conversely, the more lipoprotein lipase you have on fat cells, the more likely you are to store these triglycerides in the form of fat. Well, guess what happens as you age? you end up having less lipoprotein lipase on muscles and more of it on fat cells. Um, so it really becomes just kind of a question of fuel partitioning that is mm -hmm. diminishing. But I think it's an oversimplification to say our metabolism slows as we age. Yeah. So before, just before we got on camera here, I saw you uh, consume a meat stick, uh, which I would assume is like pure protein. Um, what is I would assume that you're about middle age. 
what is your what does your routine look like now in terms of consuming uh food you know what what portion of that is protein uh are you have you done intermittent fasting i know that you've been a big faster in the past but um uh talk to us about how it is today now how do you look at f uh, fuel and food consumption and the timing of all that um you know again, my 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 life today is not fully fully optimized around my perfection and performance it's really kind of optimized around family work and things like that so you know my day starts around 5:30 when my kids are up and it's you know in the morning it's just it's about getting the the dog out and uh having a coffee with my wife and getting my daughter off to school i mean we have to leave at 6:30 in the morning getting back getting the boys out the door i mean it's just it's just sort of a gong show and uh truthfully there isn't really any time to eat even if i wanted to yeah um, oh, so you look I, like the rest of us okay yeah <laughs> exactly exactly it's not I, I think there's this assumption that like every minute of my life revolves around you know optimized health or something like that yeah um, i imagined you waking up with one of those like vo2 max max uh, <laughs> mass uh, and you're already like on the treadmill and you're taking calls and answering emails but that's that's not the case <laughs> categorically not right yeah. um so you know my first uh my the first thing i'm eating outside of uh, a coffee is is probably post morning workout when i'm going to have typically like venison sticks um uh or you know maybe a protein shake or something like that and then and then i kind of need to have an opportunistic meal in the middle of the day um uh, opportunistic meaning like it's sometimes it happens sometimes it doesn't it just depends on how my calls are going and how they're scheduled and yeah if i'm really lucky my wife or my assistant will grab me a salad with a little uh extra chicken or steak or something to throw on it for some protein and uh and then my you know i i usually have a pretty early dinner actually um again just because of kids and stuff like that so usually i'm done eating by about 6 30 Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I try to, you know, really not eat after dinner. I really like to have three good hours of not eating before bed. It really enhances sleep for me. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's, that's kind of the way I'm doing it. But again, you can tell there's not a, an abundance of planning that goes into it. The, the, if I'm keeping track of anything throughout the day, I'm sort of keeping track of how much protein I'm getting. Yeah, I was going to ask, what are you counting macros and like how much protein are you consuming a day? Yeah, I'm I'm probably between about 140 and 180 grams per day of protein. Yeah, I mean that seems about right based on simple math. Uh, what's your weight? Uh, about 190. Okay, yeah. So that's that seems to be like what everyone's talking about is like the, the right amount of protein. Uh, how are you dealing with inflammation? I've found that as I'm aging, inflammation is becoming more of a problem and it's, I'm identifying it through certain foods. So for example, I've eliminated basically dairy from my diet. Um, I don't eat much bread, if any, once in a while I'll have some real sourdough, you know, that's just basically, uh, little flour, water, and whatever else is in sourdough. But how are you dealing with inflammation? I mean, I'm pretty fortunate in that there doesn't seem to be anything in in food that is measurably impacting inflammation. Again, it, we, we can measure inflammation through blood tests. So you can look at something like a C-reactive protein that is a very, very sensitive yet very non-specific marker of inflammation. Um, there are other markers of these as well. Um, fortunately, mine tend to be as close to unmeasurable as possible, regardless of what I'm eating. Um, I know that's not true for many people. So I know that there are undoubtedly lots of food sensitivities that don't rise to the level of being actual allergies. Um, but nevertheless, where, you know, you see low levering, low levels of simmering inflammation in people and dairy and wheat are probably two of the most notable culprits. And when you remove those things, lo and behold, that inflammation gets better. So um, I guess, knock on wood, I feel pretty lucky. I don't seem to 
I don't seem to have appreciated a change in at least measurable inflammation as I age. Now, what I think some people might perceive as inflammation, but I, I don't know that it necessarily is, uh, is, you know, I feel older. I mean, I definitely ache a little bit more. I, when I get up in the morning, I don't feel like I did when I was 30. Right. Um, how much of that is inflammation versus, you know, just wear and tear on tissue, you know, is, is sort of another issue. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I, I definitely have to pay more attention to my body now than I did even 10 years ago. It was very different at 40. Um, my capacity to, to work is not what it once was. My capacity to stack very difficult workouts on successive days is not what it once was. And therefore, I just, you know, I, I consider, I, I, I spend much more time listening to my body today. And uh, if it says, hey, you really, really pushed hard on Monday, Tuesday, we pushed a little bit hard, I think Wednesday needs to be an easier day. The answer is great. It's an easier day. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that. It, uh, I'm at that point, too. Uh, everything like everything's changing. Um and and I've been a pretty diligent now about uh, blood labs and uh, lab tests, blood tests, all that stuff uh, to, to figure out where I'm at. But uh, it's it's a little bit disheartening when you wake up and you kind of feel like you got hit by a truck and you didn't you didn't <laughs> do anything. You just like it's all different. Uh, and I don't really know whether to listen to my body sometimes or to push through. So that's, that's where I don't know. It's like, uh, like, I, I think there's a happy medium. So I'll give you yeah. my advice on this, Brian. So I think um, there's nothing worse than inactivity, right? So, yes. so, so yesterday I flew. Um, okay. So I spent, you know, I went, I went with, I went away for the weekend to visit my parents so that means I'm sleeping on a bed that's not my bed. Everything is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm not sleeping. I'm not, I'm not in my routine. I'm not eating my food. I'm not doing my thing. The flight out of, you know, from Toronto back to Austin is, you know, it's not that it's a long flight, but it's a long travel day in the airport. And to make a long story short, I land. It's like one o'clock in the afternoon. By the time I get home, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. I've done nothing all day. <laughs> but travel. So I woke up at 530 in the morning. It's now two in the afternoon. And I've done nothing. And yeah. normally, Sunday for me is a crushing day of workouts. It's a three workout day. Normally, it's okay. my biggest day of the week. Now I get home and my appetite to do anything is zero. <laughs> I just don't want to do a thing. <laughs> okay. Um and um, you know it's nice and nice to hear that you are human okay so it's very relatable okay this could be right. any any of our stories yeah and um and i decide that there's there's a happy medium somewhere between crushing the workout and doing nothing mm -hmm. so i say all right i'm gonna go get on the bike for 40 minutes on the trainer this should have been an hour but it's going to be 40 but i'm not going to push it as hard i'm gonna listen to my body and yeah. I end up probably going to about 10 beats per minute lower than where I would have gone. I get off the bike and I'm supposed to go off and do another workout, but I'm like, nope, let's everybody jump in the pool and we're just going to goof off and play in the pool. So then we just jump in the pool and goof off and play in the pool. And now I'm, I'm supposed to go in the gym and do another workout. And this is about a 90 minute workout. That's, that's really, really hard. It's and again, it's probably the hardest workout I'll do in the week. And I say, you know what, I'm not going to do it, but I am going to go in the gym for 35 minutes and just do a circuit that is not going to clobber me, but mm -hmm. it's something me and my wife will do together. So me, my wife, and the, all the kids are in the gym doing a big circuit. It ends up taking about 45 minutes. And that was the day. Yeah. So it's better than having done nothing. And by the way, my body felt better for having done that. But I didn't set myself up for damage by forcing myself. And that's, you know, that's something I would have done a few years ago, a few years ago, I would have forced that workout no matter what. And it would have come at the expense of time with my family. And it also would have come at the expense of, I think, my own long term health. So 
again, that's just one extreme example. But I would say on those days when you are so feeling beat up, go for a very long walk. Yeah. You know, inactivity is the worst thing that we can do, regardless of how we feel. Um, so, you know, a recovery walk is better than a recovery, you know, lay on the couch. Yeah. I love that message. Uh, I think it's very doable. Yeah. So it's, it is just listening to your, your body, your heart, you know, uh, and, and getting to know yourself. Uh, let's, let's dig more into mobility. How important is mobility to longevity? Well, it's very important, but again, it's, it's a, it's a very complicated topic. It's sort of like balance, like does balance matter? Well, of course, balance matters. And look at what happens when we age and our balance deteriorates. Um, the, the question and what makes it difficult is understanding what the root drivers are. You know, what is at the root of mobility? What is at the root of flexibility? What is at the root of balance? What, what is at the root neurologically? What is at the root from a structural standpoint, from a proprioceptive standpoint? And it's the real question is, how do we train those elements? And I think that's some of the most difficult part of exercise, because most things in exercise, you can tune out, right? If you're, if you're, you know, riding a stationary bike or outside for a run or doing whatever you want, like you can be listening to music, listening to podcasts. And by the way, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, right? That's sometimes a wonderful reprieve. But when you are doing a lot of this sort of movement training, it's, it requires immense concentration. Um, and every day I try to do something, even if it's only for 10 minutes that focuses very much on that. Today, the, the exercises that I worked on were foot exercises. So, mm -hmm. you know, look, you know, basically working on ways that I can um, potentiate force through different parts of my foot. These are very complicated exercises for me. My feet are far from perfect. And as I look to undo many years of incorrect movement patterns, I have to be able to work on these things which again in the moment seem and look very silly they're very they're isometric exercises of foot tension but if your feet aren't working nothing's going to work upstream of them yeah I, I know you're a big fan of like uh box jumps and step ups and whatnot um again it seems obvious but why are you going to such great lengths to work on this flexibility or mobility of, of your feet when, you know, most of us are working on our physique, how we look, you know, it's, it seems, I don't know, almost like too hyper-focused on such a small little area, but your point is the, you know, if your balance is not in check or if you're uh, playing a sport, help, help, help me understand the importance of the intricacies. I mean, again, I think it's just, it, it, there's nothing wrong with being obsessed with your physique or, you know, doing bicep curls and pushups and things like that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It yeah. is, it's purely a function of what are you optimizing for? Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm only optimizing for one thing, which is the last decade of my life, the marginal mm -hmm. decade. Yes. And I'm getting a lot of tangential and peripheral benefits today. You know, it's not like I'm debilitated today because I'm focusing on being a really healthy 85 year old. I mean, I can still do more than most 50 year olds, I'm sure. But my focus is very deliberate, right? Because I understand what the failure points are when people are in their 80s. People don't fail in their 80s because their biceps aren't strong enough. People fail in their 80s because they don't have eccentric strength in their quads. They don't have mobility in their feet. They don't have reactivity. They've lost type two muscle fibers. They have no power. This is why people fall and break their hips. And so everything I'm doing is really working on the maximum return with the minimum risk, i.e. the maximum amount of those things with the lowest risk of injury today. Um, and you know, the good news is, again, that 
I think gives me probably 80% of what a person would achieve if they were solely focused on being the best version of themselves today. Yeah, I think the book is, um, you flipped the script, at least on how we look, or how most people look at longevity, you're, you're trying to avoid, it seems, the big ticket items. And it's striking that you're starting now, let's, you know, say midlife on this, what you're calling the marginal decade, or the la basically the last decade of your life, whether that's 80 or 90, however long we get to live on this planet. Um, but you're starting now. And you're saying now, now is the time to prepare for that last decade, not when you're in the decade, because then it's too late. Yeah, again, I use, I use a, an analogy of a glider, right? So, you know, gliders are generally just going to go down. <laughs> and <laughs> once the glider hits the treetops, it's kind of over. So the time to work on how high you get towed is not when you're about to hit the treetops. Right. It's long before that. And so, you know, at 50, it's very important to me in this next decade that I gain as much altitude as possible physiologically. We call that physiologic headroom. And um, there is an, an absolute inevitability of decline. And it's it's quite nonlinear. Um, so it's going to be, you know, somewhat linear till about 75. And then it becomes again, very nonlinear, the decline goes very steep after 75. And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've both watched this personally, in people I know, but also the literature is completely unambiguous about this. Um, and so yeah, I, I look, it's never too late to start doing something. I've also seen people who have never done a thing until they're in their mid 70s. And then they decide to do something. And that's always a better outcome than doing nothing. But if you have any um, room in front of you, uh, you know, before the age of 75, yeah, I, I think it's never too soon to start. And so let's talk about order of operations. I've heard you talk about how you thought one way about nutrition, now you think a different way in terms of the order of ops. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, um, I mean, I think, I guess you're referring to kind of like the significance of each of the modifiable behaviors and, and how I think about that. Um, yeah, I would say that I do think that for virtually every human being out there, the biggest opportunity to both lengthen life and improve quality of life, at least physically, comes through exercise. Um, now, again, you have to be deliberate and you have to know what you're doing because, you know, just doing, you know, mindless exercise won't necessarily uh, close the gap. And exercise is a, a very broad term. And of course, what we're referring to here is much more nuanced. That's why exercise actually gets more chapters in the book than any other topic. I think there are three chapters on exercise because it is such an important topic. But, um, you know, there's really no upper limit to the benefits that accrue through strength and fitness. Um, whereas there really are diminishing returns with nutrition. I mean, at some point, you know, if you're in energy balance, getting adequate amounts of protein and micronutrients and things of that nature, you know, going down the rabbit hole further and further on your nutrition is only bringing marginal gains and, and may bring no gains whatsoever. Right, and, I can't, um, can't eat more yeah. vegetables. Yeah, at some point, it 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 um you know the first order thing matters, right? Which is, are you are you overnourished or undernourished or adequately nourished? I mean, that that becomes the most important driver, and how you get there is way less important than are you able to sustain it? You know that, that everybody gets so fixated on what's the best diet, and I, I again, I think the literature is just so abundantly clear on this. The best diet is whichever one you can adhere to, to mm -hmm. stay in energy balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I will co-sign that. That's, uh, that's been my experience too. Um, okay. So if exercise is number one, is nutrition number two, what's, what's number three, four or five? Sleep. I, I don't even, yeah, it would be hard to say like, what's the rank order of them. It really does depend on the individual. I mean, look, for somebody sleep might be number one, right? If a person is sleeping four hours a night, um, 
and they've got sleep apnea and they've got, you know, you know, even medical conditions like restless leg syndrome or things like that, that are untreated, then even exercise can't undo the damage of that poor sleep. So um, it, I think it's hard to say, you know, what's the, what's the first, second, third order uh, term here in, in, in a specific case, but, but in, in general, I would say that very good sleep, very good nutrition, very good exercise are going to do more for people in most regards than say the mainstream approach, which would be pharmacotherapy. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with pharmacotherapy. And there are certain problems that absolutely require pharmacotherapy where, you know, all of the nutrition, exercise, sleep in the world won't address them. But, um, the, 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 that holy, that holy trio, um, is going to, you know, get you a lot done. And by the way, if those three things are failing, no amount of drugs, hormones, and supplements in the world are ever going to fix the problem. Yeah. And that going back to my original story, which is I had no idea how interconnected the emotional health and physical health was. This was my experience. Um, I was just focused on the eating part and not focused on exercise and it wasn't doing much. And it wasn't until I really got serious about the physical part, moving my body, focusing on strength, mobility, just exercise in general, um, in combination with nutrition, that's when I actually feel figured out that I had a sleep problem. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty fit, but it turns out as you age, uh, I was having some sleep apnea, mild sleep apnea issues, just because my, my jaw was resting in a certain position and my tongue was falling back in my mouth and causing me to wake up 20 to 30 times at night. And I was just feeling wrecked when I woke up, but I had no idea, right? It was only because uh, uh, I, I finally went in to talk to several doctors to try and figure out what was happening. And, and I actually, the doctors couldn't solve it for me. What happened was the pulmonary specialist said, oh, you should wear a CPAP machine. And I said, what's that? And it ended up being this starfish, you know, shaped uh, uh the thing that went on my face and pumped oxygen i had it for like two weeks and i thought there's no way this is not going to scale i'm not wearing this till i'm 90 um i've got to figure out something else i just did a little research on my own and figured out that if i lost a little bit more weight um that that might do the trick and sure enough i so i dropped about 10 pounds um and the apnea went away and so it was that combination of you know taking care of my body through exercise, eating properly, and then the sleep kind of fell into place. And then what a miracle. I started feeling like a million bucks, like everything turned around for me. Um, and that's when I really started to sort of dial down then into the science of it, getting more serious about my, my labs and understanding my hormone levels. Uh, anyway, so I'm just, I'm, I'm co-signing everything that I'm, I'm reading so far in the book. I'm loving it. Uh, I hope it's a roadmap for other people who are like me. Um, a, a couple of the other things I wanted to talk about were um, what should we be tracking? You know, the metrics. Uh, what should we be looking at at when we do our blood panels? What are some of these big ticket items? You know, the whether it's cholesterol or testosterone or triglycerides or you know, what are some of these markers? that people should go into their doctors and requesting? Well, um, there, there are many. Um, I think that um, it would be hard for me to kind of give just a top five. Um, there are, you know, a couple that stand out that you, you only need to measure once, but everybody I think should know them. You know, I think everybody should know their APOE genotype. Um, that's a gene that says a lot about your risk of cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease. And um, again, it's not a, it's not a gene that's deterministic. So it's not like learning this locks you into a fate, but for some people it can be the real motivation they need to take prevention seriously. Um, there's also a really unique uh, lipoprotein called LP little a that um, is shockingly prevalent. So somewhere between eight and 12% of the population 
walking around have an elevated level of this. And it's the number one cause, um, number one hereditary driver of cardiovascular disease. A lot of times you hear about these otherwise healthy people having heart attacks in their 40s or 50s. Very often it's attributed to this. Mm. So that's unfortunately something most doctors don't look for. So I, I really suggest that everybody ask for that test. Um, and, um, you know, the most important lipid I think to be looking for is ApoB. And I, in the book, I explain in great detail why that's the case. Um, but um, yeah, it would be hard to say there's, there's, you know, even a top five, it is, uh, it's, it's a pretty exhaustive list of things uh, in there. How often should we be getting our blood checked? I mean, I think it depends on how often you're doing something to perturb the system. Um, so for some people that might mean once a year, for some people that might mean four times a year. Um, you know, if you're, you know, changing something, then I think it makes sense to try to measure it. Um, but if you're kind of on autopilot, it might be that, you know, just an annual comprehensive blood test is sufficient. How about VO2 max? Talk about that a little bit. Uh, do you, do the listeners know what it means or should I explain what it means? Yeah. Break it down. And, uh, I, I wouldn't even know where to go get something like that tested. So talk about what it is, why it's important, what it measures and, and then how, how do we go find a place so we can see where we're at? Well, um, maybe even before I say all that, I should just point out why we're talking about it. There's no metric of a person's health. There's nothing you can measure about a person that is a stronger predictor of how long they will live than their VO2 max. So hopefully that provides some motivation for people to pay attention <laughs> as we talk about this. So VO2 max um, is, is the maximum ventilation rate of oxygen. That's the technical term for it. And that is measured under basically only two conditions, either when you're on a stationary uh, bike or on a treadmill and you have um, a very elaborate face mask, you know, strapped to your face that is measuring the amount of oxygen you consume as you are pushed to a maximal effort. So this is a very difficult test. It takes about 20 minutes and that includes kind of a warm up and ramp up until you are pushed to a maximal effort and somewhere close to that very maximal effort the sensor, the oxygen sensor in the device will be able to detect the maximum amount of oxygen you've consumed in liters per minute. That's normalized to your body weight. And ultimately, this is a number that's reported in milliliters per kilogram per minute. Um, where you can get this done is basically anywhere. You know, if you if, if you live in a a reasonably sized city, you can search anywhere and get this done. Uh, here in Austin, uh, we send patients to uh, a, a lab at the University of Texas. Um, and, you know, it's about a $100 test. So the biggest cost is the pain of the test, not not the dollars you're going to pay for it. Um, okay. And uh, that that number basically is the single best predictor um, of your cardiorespiratory fitness, and then by extension, how long you live. So um, we really like to see our patients have that number be very high for their age and for their sex. This series is called Behind the Brand. We talk about brands. People are brands. Uh, people are people, are people. but also, you know, we have a personal brand. What would you say is the Dr. Peter Atia brand? Well, that's a really good question. I don't know. Um, I'd be curious what others would say. It's uh, um, yeah, I'm not really sure what my brand is. It seems like you follow a very non-conventional path, and and that also seems very deliberate. So, so why have you chosen that non-conventional path? Do you, do you agree with that? Like it's you're off the beaten path a bit. Um, yeah, I would say that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think that's part of your brand. I think that's, uh, it seems like it's a deliberate choice. And so why, why have you decided or why do you think? I don't know. I think that's a consequence of something. Else. I don't, I don't know that that's actually deliberate. I think it just, um, 
if 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 everybody else saw medicine the way I did now, I don't think I would be compelled to come up with something different just to be different. I um um I, I suppose anybody who who has a who has a, a sort of different point of view would say that, but um yeah, I don't I don't um yeah, I don't I don't know that I feel the need to be to be different about it. I just I feel the need to be nuanced about something, I suppose. That that might be more the case. Um mm. Yeah, so that that might be it. That's not that's not a very interesting brand, the brand <laughs> of nuance. <laughs> well, I find it fascinating because again, it's it's it was my experience. I did not have good luck or very good taste with my visits to every conventional doctor on the planet. I went, you know, when I started having some health issues, I had headaches. And uh first thing I did is went to see a, you know, a neurologist. And uh, he immediately said, oh, you know, this is easily solved. I, I know what's wrong with you. You have migraines and here's some pills. And so, oh, okay. Is that the answer? Okay. So then I was still having headaches after that. So I went to see the cardiologist and he said, oh, I know what's wrong. Uh, you know, uh, you have your red blood cell count is a little bit too high. Uh, your BP is a little high, you know, take statins. And so, you know, with each visit to each doctor, it was very myopic view of my condition. And of course, you know, their specialty, uh, they tried to diagnose and treat it, but none of them could really figure out my problem. It, it turns out after, you know, all these doctor visits and, you know, all this money spent, um, I, I, I started trying to figure out what was happening to me personally, took responsibility for my, my own health and, and listening to, people like you who are sort of off off the traditional path and i found that it was um largely electrolytes <laughs> that i was dehydrated that i was mm -hmm. drinking plenty of water but i was uh, missing a certain you know potassium uh magnesium uh and sodium and that largely solved my headache issue of course you know i had other issues like the apnea that was happening and and i think part of be just being fatigued was also lending my headaches, but none of the doctors could figure that out. I had to figure that out on my own or piece it together. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for you and for people like you who are thinking differently or nuanced about health, longevity, all these things that we're, we're all interested in figuring out how to, how to do it. Um, and so, you know, I would say, yeah, I, I'm really grateful for that brand of thinking that it's different and it's, I don't know, it it's changed my life. So I, I, it's hard for me to put into words how how meaningful, how much the impact is. But yeah, it means a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Happy to be a small part of it. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm. We're about out of time here. Um, I think I've got enough to work on. I can piece this together in the edit. Um, I'm going to finish the book and then I'll have, uh, you know, my full, my full, uh, write up and capability here. Is there anything else that we didn't cover? Uh, maybe you want to leave some final parting words to those who are on this path of longevity, words of advice or wisdom. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would just say that, um, it's really easy to to sort of um, ignore this problem in the in the in the here and now, um, and therein lies, I think, the challenge of anything that, whether it be saving for retirement or studying for a you know a, a quiz as opposed to going out to a party when you're in college. I mean, any of these things where there's some amount of delayed you know, gratification involved. Um, I think none probably are more relevant than this one because I don't think I've ever met a person who near the end of their life didn't wish that they had more health, right? It's not, and it's not so much the years in the life, but the health in those years. Um, I, we all accept that we're going to die. And I don't think there's anything in this book that I talk about that 
suggests otherwise, or even suggests that there's some path to enormous life extension. What we're really talking about here is how do you maximize the quality of life in those years? And very small amounts of consistent, deliberate effort before you feel you need it will pay off so much at the end. And um, I just, I hope that this book can help people um, see that, internalize that and, and put it into action. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view. Uh -huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Uh -huh. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents. Shotgun riders too biased, they all liars. I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired. But I'm never giving up, that's why I'm kinda admired. Role model, like it or not, I gotta play it. Sugarcoat the rhyme sometimes, but still say it. Said I was quitting at 40, it's just a fib. I'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib. You ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? Cried over every opportunity wasted yeah. good and bad news which one you want first either, either way you pick the bad still gonna hurt you the worst i never got the basket and the fruits of the labor uh -uh. and i never got the cash